Good evening and welcome to Alamark Christian Church. During the days of Advent, beginning on December the 1st, we have been reading a book together called Keeping Christmas by Alison Pittman. Alison is a wonderful writer and compares the transformation of Ebenezer Scrooge in Dickens' story A Christmas Carol to the transformation that you and I go through when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. If you are watching these on the internet, you can leave us a comment. And if you watch all 25 episodes, we would love to send you a copy of this book. So let us know that you're following along and we hope that you enjoy with us Keeping Christmas. Today is December the 14th, the 14th day of Advent. We're going to open the drawer for today on the Advent calendar and find out the next part of our Christmas story. And we have another shepherd. The shepherds in their fields at night stood by their sheep astounded as the stars twinkled up above and the heavenly voice resounded. Keeping Christmas, chapter 14, within the robe, want. It's the interior of Scrooge's office in the evening. The collector of the charity says, Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Scrooge sneeringly replies, Are there no prisons? The collector of the charity says, Plenty of prisons. Scrooge responds, And the... Union workhouses, are they still in operation? The collector of the charity resigns, says they are. Still, I wish I could say they were not. Scrooge sarcastically again says, Oh, I was afraid that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. Cut to the exterior, night, an abandoned London street, snow-covered dark. Ebenezer Scrooge stands beside the towering figure of the ghost of Christmas present, now aged, with a gray beard and long iron-gray hair. At the feet of the ghost are two ragged, emaciated children clinging to his robe. They are ignorance and want. Scrooge is trembling and says, Spirit, are they yours? And the ghost says, They are man's. And they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. Scrooge says, have they no refuge or resource? And the ghost, summoning all his strength, says, are there no prison? 
Are there no workhouses? And then the bell strikes 12. When I teach a Christmas carol, my students go nuts at this moment in the movie. They hoot, ooh, burn, because what is more satisfying than seeing a villain's own words used against him? It's the ultimate insult. It's the pinnacle of, I know you are, but what am I? I, almost like the kids, are waiting for the spirit to burst out with something insulting about Scrooge's mother. I let them enjoy the moment. After all, we are usually watching the film on the last day before Christmas break. They are sugared up on candy canes, and I have a gift bag full of teacher Christmas gifts. Starbucks cards, candles, cool pens, and comfy socks. We're all just ready to go, but there's far more to this moment than the spirits clap back. Yes, hearing the ugliness of Scrooge's heartless greed spoken by the symbolic embodiment of Christ is jarring. This, we want to say, is the moment of Scrooge's conviction, the moment he recognizes and repents of his sinful nature. After all, these are the Spirit's final words coming from the same guy who hours before sat on top of an entire buffet's worth of food and beckoned Scrooge to his side. It's like the Spirit has been just waiting for this moment to drop the best bon mot of his short life. Perfect timing, impeccable delivery. Bell strikes 12, mic drops, spirit out. Except it isn't. Meaning that it isn't the moment that Scrooge turns his heart. That happened just a breath before. One line of dialogue above. Scrooge's heart is already broken. Remember he said, have they no refuge or resource? These are not the words of the Christmas Eve Scrooge. This is a question posed by a man who recognizes want and wishes to heal it. True, he is not quite at the place to offer up himself and make sacrifices in his life, but he has completely transformed from the man who would want these pitiable waifs to just hurry up and die already. His is the heart of King David writing in Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict, and justified when you judge. Through all the wanderings in the past, and all the invisible spying on this Christmas, Scrooge, has come to his own conclusion. The spirit, past and present, have only required Scrooge to look upon himself and those whose lives he touches. There's been no browbeating, no accusations, not even from Marley, who knows Scrooge better than anyone else on earthish. Jesus tells us how fruitless it is to point out our sins to each other. Our eyes have to be upon our own. In this last moment, the Spirit gives Scrooge something to see. When the Spirit parrots Scrooge's hate-filled words, the intent is not condemnation. The Savior does not pour judgment into a heart broken for him. Instead, the exchange gives Scrooge and us, the readers, a chance to see the reclaimed Scrooge in full contrast with the lost Scrooge. The first called for prison and workhouses. This new man wishes for resources and refuge. Further, this exemplifies what David writes in verse 4 of the psalm. Against you, you only have I sinned. Scrooge's words spoken from his hardened heart, carried his sin. The Spirit isn't throwing them at Scrooge, they're simply bouncing back. The Spirit may disappear with the chiming of the clock, but Scrooge will see him again 
in his eternal form. Then he will be the king, and he will say to Ebenezer, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Matthew 25 and 40. But that conversation isn't going to come for a while. The bell might be tolling, but it is not tolling for Scrooge, at least not yet. I hope you will join us tomorrow for chapter 15. Good night and God bless. Thank you.